regulations. Now we're getting into the nitty gritty. This is a wildlife rehabilitation permittee, and this is the chain, this is the system. You are being regulated by the Pennsylvania Game Commission directly in Pennsylvania. They regulate wildlife rehabilitation. Over top of them is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Any bird that flies over state lines or has the capability of it and is on the federal migratory species list, you have to have both a state and a federal permit for turkeys and pheasants that have to walk across the state line. They're just state birds, but if you want to do birds, you have to have both a state and a federal permit. And this is kind of how the chain of command goes. Now, along with that, you have your veterinarian. Unique situation here. A veterinarian is allowed to take in any wild animal to give it emergency care, but they cannot rehabilitate a wild animal. They must, when they get it in, call a rehabilitator and let them know that they have it. And once they're finished with their emergency treatment, they have to turn it over to a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. Any vet can take them in, but they have to hook up with a rehabilitator soon. In the same token, no wildlife rehabilitator can become licensed without a sponsoring veterinarian. So it's a symbiotic relationship. You need each other if you want to do wildlife. You have then the rehab assistant, an assistant giving food and care husbandry. Then you have your volunteers and at Red Creek the rehab assistant is above the volunteers and our rehab assistant is a paid position. You're almost never going to find that because you have to find a rehabilitator who's making enough money to survive on their own and pay somebody else. Few and far between. But if you want to become a rehabilitator I want you to become that kind of rehabilitator where you can hire an assistant because I want you to be that successful. You have housing subpermittees, which take animals home and raise them. They're actually written on your permit, so they're called a subpermittee. And you have capture and transport permittees or subpermittees. They are the people that go out in the field and capture animals and bring them to the wildlife center. So that's your group. And the ones supporting all this are your supporters. They're the people who are giving you the money. This is the only note I want you to take. RedCreekWildlifeCenter.com and then the forward slash, it's on the same key as question mark, intro, and the forward slash again. You type that into your web browser and a page will come up with all kind of links, all kind of instructions, all kind of papers, PDF files for you to download, with everything on it, I am about to tell you. This is what's on your handouts. First thing is an introduction to wildlife rehab. Is wildlife rehabilitation for you? This is a really good guide and it goes into more depth of what I've been talking about today. It's a, it's a very thorough book put out by another state. It's excellent and they offer it for free. The regulations are up there. We have the, the Pennsylvania Game Commission, all the regs on wildlife rehab updated are on there for you to download. I would really suggest you read them thoroughly. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife regulations for migratory birds are up there, as well as the minimum standards for wildlife rehabilitation, this, but it's free to download, or you can pay like six bucks to get this little neat little bound volume from the IWRC or the NWRA. That's the National Wildlife Rehabilitators Association or the International Wildlife Rehabilitators Council. They put out this guide that tells you what the caging best practices are. And U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Game Commission uses this as a guideline in seeing if you are doing well by the animals that you're taking care of. So if you're going to build a cage for a red-tailed hawk, I would Take a look at this and see what the size is, and then do better. There are links for education and study. There's links to our website. We have online classes. We have wildliferehabilitationschool.com, and up there at the moment is a, med a medical math class for rehabilitators. It's a three-week course, and a telephone skill class, how to deal with the public without losing your cool. <laughs> how to deal with people on the phone, there, that's a three-week course. 
They're really cheap. We realize rehabilitators is not much money, so we don't charge much, but it does help support our missions. But the medical math class is up there because I learned a long time ago never again to teach a live math class and expect to finish it. It just doesn't work. So we turned it into an online class so people can take it at their own pace. There is also a paper that states wildlife rehabilitation study materials. It is the paper that the Game Commission sends out that has the study materials that you study for the test. A lot of stuff is for free. Some of the books you have to buy. If you study them thoroughly, you'll really know what you're doing. And that's what the tests are designed to do, is to find out if you really know what you're doing. Principles of Wildlife Rehabilitation is one of the standards. That is right here. It is a big binder, and it's put out by the National Wildlife Rehabilitators Association. It's around 100 bucks or so. I'm not really sure what they sell it for now. One of the things I would definitely suggest, and this comes also from the National Wildlife Rehabilitators Association, is the quick reference guide. You know what all the terminology and everything is that's used. These are great. The minimum standards, which I already showed you. The download for that is on this paper too. Basics in wildlife rehabilitation. I got that one here somewhere. No, I don't. Never loan out your books. <laughs> don't get them back. Oh, somebody just went, ugh, you're right. Wildlife capture and transport. It is the manual used to study for your wildlife capture and transport. That manual, the link to that is on there. It's free. Download it. It's got a lot of good information. There is a, a manual put out called Field Manual of Wildlife Diseases. It is free. You can download it off the internet. It is an excellent, excellent resource. Infectious Diseases and Wild Animals, you can get it at Amazon.com. But the, the links to these are all there. Pennsylvania Game Notes, you can download them off the Pennsylvania Games, a Game Commission's website or call the district office and say, I would like a set. And they will give them to you for free. They used to make them in these really, really cool wildlife notebooks and singles now. You can either print them off yourself off their website, they are free, or you can get a full set from the Pennsylvania Game Commission. All you have to do is ask. By singles, what she means is each page or each sets of pages is a different species is, or group of animals. It's own little printout. Right. Pennsylvania Endangered Species is also a publication put out by the Game Commission. You can get it for free. Also, they have it all on their website. You can download it. Another thing in your handout, a list of all the Wildlife Rehabilitation and Education Advisory Council. This is a group of people, most of them rehabilitators. There's a vet. There's another a woman on there who's a doctor. What this council does is advise the Game Commission on wildlife rehabilitation issues. I am on that council. If you apply for a license, take your test, pass your test, you sit in front of that council, I'll be on it. And we're really cool. So you don't have to worry about it. A lot of people worry about that part of the test. We're all regular Joes. There's a link to the PAWR website, which has a list of all the wildlife rehabilitators in Pennsylvania. If you need a sponsoring rehabilitator and you're too far away from me, that's where you go. Find somebody close to you, volunteer for them, find some other centers. If you want to become a wildlife rehabilitator, I honestly would suggest you do not just volunteer at one center and learn one person's way. Volunteer at different centers, get to know other people's ways, because there's all different kind of ways to rehabilitate wildlife. Set up a center and little tricks people have, you really can learn a lot. There is a link to the National Wildlife Rehabilitators Association, and they have lots of really cool things that information books that you can buy on there. And they even have, I think the IWRC, the international one, has ones like if you just want to do a certain species, they have these, they're like six bucks, but it tells you how to do like a raccoon. Uh, it's catalogs. How to set bird's wings, immobilization of fractures. They have all these different topics and they're cheap. Here's this one. That one's for mammals. You can go on your handouts. You can read the regulations. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty. I'm just going to make you a few comments about the regulations. First of all, the regulations allow you to possess wild animals. It allows you to do a few other things too. Did you know in Pennsylvania it's illegal to pick up a roadkill? 
No. Unless it's a deer, and you have to call the game commission within a period of time and say, I picked up a deer and I'm going to eat it. And then they will send you a free permit that you must consume that deer within three months. It is illegal in Pennsylvania to possess a wild animal. The fine is $1,500 per animal. So you take in a litter of six baby bunnies? That's $9,000 in bunny fines. You're exempt. You can have them. Better know what to do with them. But it allows you possession. These are permits. These are not licenses. If you are licensed to do something, you have control. This is not licensing. We call it licensing, but it's, it's incorrect. And the authorities will be very quick to remind you. This is a permit. You are permitted to do this. This is, you are not licensed. You are not, you have no authority. <laughs> the regulations do outline some housing guidelines. The federal ones, a little bit more. Some are a little funky, like every animal has to have fresh water every day. That's a good thing. Unless you have an owl that doesn't drink water and it freezes overnight, well, guess what? He doesn't drink water, he better have water. I don't care because it's in the regulations. So you need to read them and know them, okay? And unless there's reason for water not to be in there, such as this bird keeps falling over into, you know, and will drown if, it, if there's a water dish in with it, there better be a good reason. Housing guidelines have to do with pretty much cleanliness, overcrowding, things like that. But when you get into the federal regulations, they do pretty much adhere to the minimum standards. And the minimum standards, for the most part, are good. But nobody's going to walk up to your place with a tape measure. You want to really, really do your best to try to stay in line with the guidelines. They will give you restrictions, such as the federal say that an animal can only remain in rehabilitation for 180 days. That is six months. And it states if it has to stay longer, you need their permission. And some animals will have to stay longer. And you know what? You write them a letter or an email saying, this animal needs to stay you know, for an extended period of time because of this. Why and they're I? really cool about it. Why? Big thing, you cannot put rehab animals on display. You cannot take an owl that's growing up and take it to a school and say, I would like you to see what I do. That's a different kind of permit. That's an education permit, and it's completely different than rehab, although it's connected. And when you've been rehabilitating for a period of time, like around two years or so, and you're no longer considered a novice, you're considered like, I know what I'm doing, I don't have to be like overseen all the time. You can apply for an education permit, possess some animals to do education with, like we have some birds of prey. But it is completely, totally, not allowed for a rehab animal for the public to be able to see them. Good for the animals, that's why. Also, you are not allowed to charge. Someone brings you in an animal, you can ask for a donation, you cannot mandate it. That's actually in the regulations. That is one of the reasons there is no funding, but how many people who find a baby animal are going to bring it if they know they are required to pay a fee? Here's how you apply. These step-by-step -step instructions are actually on that web page. You can follow it. I'm not taking it down. You don't have a limited time. You can go back to this whenever you want. This is the process. The first thing you do is you contact the district office of the Pennsylvania Game Commission, and there are nine of them. There's the Southeast region, the Northeast region, South Central, North Central, etc. There is a link on your handouts to the Pennsylvania Game Commission website that lists every county, what district they're in, and what the contact information is for you. You need to call them and tell them you are interested in receiving a packet on wildlife rehabilitation. What you will get is everything I'm giving you today. You'll get that paper with all the study material on it. You will get the regulations, which you're already going to have. But one thing you need is it's a multi-carbon application. You need that. They will send that to you. They are also going to give you the name of your local WCO. Your wildlife conservation officer in your county, in your part of your county, is going to be your boss. When you feel you're ready, 
you mail in that packet that's that sent or that application to him you want to write a letter in the letter you want to state three things first of all I want to become a wildlife rehabilitator you also have to mention what tests you want to take what you want to do they're only going to give you the test you asked for and there's only three remember the mammal then the raptors and the non raptors you also must write down how much experience you have and how you got it if you say I've been rehabilitating squirrels in my bedroom for the last 15 years without a license and no one knows it they're not going to give you a license so get some experience at a wildlife rehab center if you don't have any that's where you volunteer the federal regs for you to do migratory birds do require 100 hours over a year you can't have worked at a rehab center five years ago and haven't touched it since and use that experience it has to be 100 hours within the last year you need to also send a letter from your zoning supervisor saying that you're not disallowed it's like a double negative they're not going to say oh she's allowed to do this but they're going to say there's nothing in zoning that prohibits this you need a letter from a sponsoring wildlife rehabilitator you have to be sponsored by someone who already has a permit it should be someone local you also need a letter from a veterinarian saying that they will sponsor you and all those letters need to say is I agree to assist and or advise so and so in their wildlife rehabilitation efforts that's all they have to say they don't have to promise anything all they have to do is say they're willing to assist and or advise your WSO is going to call you and go yo can I come by for a visit he's going to look at your setup he's going to meet you if you're a wacko and you talk to animals <laughs> he's going to take your application he's going to go not approved he's going to send it in and it ends so be professional and remember this is a public service remember that you want to keep wildlife out of the hands of the public because a lot of times this guy he doesn't care about the individual animal he cares about the health of the species and public health that's what he's worried about get on the same page as him talk to him ask him some questions when he approves it he will send your application into Harrisburg you will get a call or a letter stating you go down to the district office you take the written test there is no time limit on taking the test but it is closed book so you can't take study materials or anything like that with you. You take your test, you leave, and then you wait. You will then get a letter from the Game Commission stating whether or not you passed. 80% is passing. You have to get 80% right. If you passed, you will then be invited to visit with the Wildlife Rehabilitation Advisory Council for an interview. I sit on it. We're cool. It's nothing to be afraid of. We actually try to help people become rehabilitators at this interview you are to submit photos of anything you have set up already with the understanding that we don't expect people to have spent twenty thousand dollars for something when they don't even know that they have a permit yet so if you don't have your facility set up that's okay we might go you're approved but you need to set up facilities first then in the mail you get your permit or Hopefully, they tell you why you didn't get it if you were disapproved, but I'm going to tell you something. Anybody gets, passes their test and gets to the council interview, I've never seen one turned down. You get your game commission permit. You now can do mammals and ground birds. You cannot do songbirds. You cannot do raptors. You have to get your federal permit. On your handouts, there are applications. The entire process of getting it federally is outlined. And really, they just, it's more duplicate stuff. It's more of an application. You don't have to take a test. You do have to send in photographs of your facilities, so they need to be done. They will not give it to you if you don't have facilities up. So you have to show them that you have the caging for these animals. By the time you've met the state requirements, you've met all the federal ones. All you have to do is show them that. You send in a copy of your permit, you send in pictures of your facilities and a description of your 
experience along with their application all filled out and duplicate and all that and you're fine you're gonna get it age you have to be 18 and they are the ones that require that 100 hours but 20 hours of it can be you go into seminars the rehab assistant I already told you about this is Greg he is my rehab assistant he is paid which means we have become successful enough to pay salaries and he doesn't even make minimum wage although we don't pay him a lot he's higher than minimum wage and I'm getting paid too after 17 years I actually am taking a salary and I stopped grooming dogs I get too old to work two full-time jobs you can get that successful don't let anybody tell you you can't and it doesn't have to take you 17 years because I was an idiot and I did it as a hobby pretty much and figured I could support it myself and didn't look any further than that till this one came along it goes you know you have to turn it into a business now we're talking to the levels before we were talking about getting licensed which comes into financial planning this is what most people need to do you need to become incorporated and get your 501c3 designation and there's a lot of fallacies out there about it and I want to talk to you about it really quick but there's a few myths I'd like to dispel really quick one is that you will lose control of what you built because you have to have a board of directors there have been rehabilitation centers there's been SPCA's there's been all kind of corporations where the person that found it the person that started it ended up getting kicked out by their own board and they lost their own organization in Pennsylvania that does not need to happen there's a way to set up your corporation right from the beginning that nobody can take it out from under you and it all, all it has to be is a couple little sections in your bylaw it cannot be taken from underneath your feet at all and it's all legal because we live in Pennsylvania one good thing about PA so don't let anybody tell you that you could lose your corporation because if you set it up properly in the first place that can be avoided completely the paperwork's too complicated just like you can learn to do something step by step by step in anything this can be done step by step also and we can teach you how to do that how to write the bylaws how to file your incorporation papers how to write the 501c3 application we got ours in five weeks unheard of you need a lawyer you need an accountant <laughs> bullshit you don't we did it five weeks we got it never talked to an accountant never talked to a lawyer so we didn't have to pay those fees he and I did it and we did it methodically what we did was every day we worked on one or two questions and we did it thoroughly and put it together and the person who got that packet in the mail who worked for the IRS probably was really happy because I sent along all these newspaper articles about us releasing an eagle and all these pictures of baby animals and things like that and they're like wow this is a lot more interesting than that <clears throat> one fallacy is it costs too much I'm going to tell you exactly how much it costs the first thing you have to do is register for a fictitious name we're Red Creek Wildlife Center that's fictitious Inc you got to put that on it $75 in Pennsylvania then you have to advertise it you have to advertise it in two places a local newspaper and in a legal journal which you can get that information from your local courthouse when we did it it cost us about hundred dollars in advertising fees although it might be a little bit more than that you have to get an EIN number this is an employer identification number you get this from the IRS it costs nothing you need it even though you're not going to be an employer right away you need it because that's how they identify businesses doesn't cost anything next you have to send in your articles of incorporation this is the most important step to getting your 501c3 if you fill out the article of incorporation papers in Pennsylvania according to how Pennsylvania has it laid out you will not get your 501c3 because Pennsylvania and the IRS do not have the same requirements and if you don't meet the requirement you won't get it so they have to be written in a specific way where you add stuff to it that they don't ask for and we can teach you how to do that the articles of incorporation if they're done properly the first time and you don't have to refile them like I did cost you $125 then you have to advertise that and that's another hundred bucks 
Then you send in your IRS 501c3 application and you have a year and a half after you get your incorporation to file this or you have to give an explanation why you took longer than that. And that has two different fees. One is if you expect to make under $10,000 a year, the fee is 400. This is the most expensive part of it. If you expect to make under or over 10,000, it is 850. And a lot of people will go, well, I ought to go with the 10,000. But you think small, you get small. You think big, no matter what you get, it's bigger than small. Pay it up front, get it out of the way. And then when you get $100,000 in, because you had a really good campaign, you don't have to worry about going to the IRS and going, we didn't think we'd make that much. So here's what I want you to do. If you want to become a rehabilitator, here's how you get started. Start studying. Download that stuff on the internet. Start studying today. The biggest learning curve is going to be learning about the wildlife. Okay, so start studying all the reference material. The, buy the books. Spend the money on the books. Volunteer at a local wildlife center. Talk with your family. Make sure they are on board. Otherwise, it's a deal breaker or a family breaker. You don't want to end up in a divorce over rehabilitating wildlife. Look into the local ordinances, especially zoning. Start developing a relationship with your vets. Maybe write a letter to a bunch of them if you don't know them. See who might be interested in wildlife rehabilitation. Get a sponsor, hopefully your local rehabilitator, hopefully. If you don't have a local one or you don't have a local one that's open to helping, that's not, that's not a deal breaker because other rehabilitators are willing to jump in. It's just, it's better if it's done locally because then they're, they're there to help you. Put your financial plan in place. Do this first. Honest to God, you should be incorporated before you get your license. That way you can start raising money to pay for everything. Start getting your supplies, start building your caging, and then get your permits. And then start small. Don't overwhelm yourself in the beginning and build up gradually. Infant care, if you want to take care of baby animals in your home but not be a wildlife rehabilitator, you can give temporary care. There are some good things and some bad things about this. Most of it is infant feeding. Most of it is common species. I don't know a single rehabilitator that is going to give a subpermittee a baby fisher. Bunnies, squirrels, things like that, yeah. But they're not going to give you odd animals. So you're not going to see the really funky stuff. You're going to see the everyday common species. And it's only going to be for infant care. You don't have to deal with the public. Your phone number is not published. It's not allowed to be published. So people aren't going to be calling you. But that also means you're not allowed to take in the animals from the public. Your Aunt Margaret calls you up and say, I have baby bunnies in my yard. You're not, you can't take them. They have to go to the rehabber. The rehabber then has to give them to you because you are actually working for them. So it has to go through the center. You cannot have volunteers because every one of the people handling those animals in your home have to be on the rehabilitator's permit. They have to be named. You can't get someone to help you. If you can't take care of them that day, take them back to the center. You are not giving animals medical attention. If an animal gets sick on you, you don't diagnose it, you don't care for it, you take it back to the wildlife center. You don't get to release things. Now, most of your subpermittees also volunteer. So you get to be part of all those other things anyway. But the animal must go back to the rehabilitation center for outdoor housing and evaluations and such. And then they're, they're the ones who decide when it gets released. So this is really nursery care. You have to meet the housing requirements, which means if it's RVS, you have to have specific caging, uh, vaccinations, things like that. Capture and transport permit T, that is a permit all in itself. You have to have a permit with the Game Commission and be listed as a subpermittee with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. You have to take a test. You have to pass with 80%. This it means that you can go out and capture animals, bring them back to the Wildlife Rehabilitation Center under their direction. Training, 
you have to pass the test or take a class that's been approved. Our class has been approved because actually the whole program is built on the class we teach. You also have to get continuing education every two years. And then you're listed as a sub-permittee on the, the rehabilitator's federal permit. Then you can go out and pick up birds of prey. We have additional requirements. We don't allow people to get a capture and transport permit through us, for us, on our permit, unless they volunteer here, because I want to know that you really can handle that red tailed hawk and you're not an idiot. You have to be approved by the director. <clears throat> That's why. <laughs> volunteer. You can volunteer for a wildlife rehabilitation. They are the most important person in a wildlife center. They are the backbone. We could not survive without them. We have 22. If I didn't have them, I wouldn't be here. They get to do everything. They get to feed things. They get to rescue things. They get to help with medical care. They don't get to direct it. They don't have to euthanize. At Red Creek, our volunteers don't euthanize anything. But they get to assist with all kinds of really cool stuff, including bandaging and or working on a fawn. You get to do some funky stuff once in a while. Yes, this is the one I put around his neck. And you get to release. And that is the most important part. So you need to go to pawr.com, find a rehabilitator near you, and maybe you will get to be part of this. Help decrease and eliminate uh, unwanted birds, uh, birds that are not indigenous to Pennsylvania, such as the sparrows, the English house sparrows, the starlings. And it appears this, this eagle ate some starling. I'm hoping that he does his part. We've certainly done our part in, in getting him to this point uh, of health and strength and the ability to fly and the ability to hunt and the ability to go out there back into the wild. All right. Have a good one.